1965 Ford Cortina GT. Built in January of 1965. It is sort of far from stock now, and I'd like to go through some of the details on the car, showing what's been done to it, and some condition flaws, and uh, just little idiosyncrasies in pieces of it that I put together. So uh, let's take a look. It's powered by a Honda S2000 F20C four-cylinder motor, roughly 240 horsepower, capable of 9,000 RPM. It's fed through a S2000 six-speed gearbox, puts the power down through a narrowed RX-7 GLS, GSLE um, rear end uh, with a limited slip. Also gives it uh, four-wheel disc brakes. Uh, it's got coilovers at all four corners. The fronts are Alita coilover struts. The rears are AFCO coilovers. Rear end no longer is leaf spring. It's a uh, four link with a pannered rod. Originally the car was left hand drive and we converted it to right hand drive with a steering rack rather than the uh, stock steering box. Let's do a cold start and pull it out of the light and take a closer look. So as you can see, the uh, Honda gauge cluster is in there. It's hooked up to a stock Honda S2000 fuel tank. So the gas gauge, all the gauges work. These Cortina GT gauges, the original ones, are pretty much just for show at this point. They're not actually hooked up. All right, so switch the key, turn it on, you get that whole thing. Hit the start button and it'll set kind of a high idle for about two and a half minutes and then it'll drop down to about a thousand RPM. And there it is. You can see the roll cage extends to the very front corners of the chassis. Uh, these are K-Mac adjustable strut tops, allowing for camber and caster adjustability. Critiquing further, this car was already engine swapped when I first bought it 24 years ago. It had a twin cam Fiat motor and a five speed in it. So there are a lot of different holes from different mounting things over the years. Uh, and there's plenty of uh, holes from uh, things that were abandoned uh, during the swap from left to right hand drive as well. So I referred to some of the idiosyncrasies of swapping the car to right-hand drive, which I wanted to do because I'm a weirdo. Uh, the first one is the door, left-hand door is still keyed. The right-hand side, passenger side, ex-passenger side, uh, is not keyed. So that locks from the inside, whereas you lock the <laughs> now passenger door from the outside. So ingress after having it locked you've got to kind of get in the left door and then open it open your uh, driver's door from the inside um the hood release is still on the left hand side that's a leftover from uh being left hand drive the windshield wiper sweep if you'll notice is backwards for right hand drive cars they would go the other direction that's not an issue as far as visibility goes it's just you know somebody might give you grief about that. I don't know. It doesn't bother me. The wiper motor itself is actually out of the Honda S2000 and uh, is operated by switch on the dash. Uh, it's two speed, fast and faster, and um, it doesn't actually have a park function, so you actually need to stop them where you want to stop. So. And then there's the transmission tunnel. Not really an idiosyncrasy, it's just 
larger than stock due to the ginormous size of the Honda S2000 bell housing and transmission. Um, it's nearly as big as the motor, so it required cutting the center part of the car out and fabricating a new, taller transmission tunnel, which ended up basically axing the whole heater system. <laughs> just wasn't room to put the heater back in there, uh, which, you know, I live in a pretty mild climate, so didn't really bother me. These air vents, those vents, are really not hooked up to anything as a result. This is the Honda S2000 ignition. Uh, takes the standard Honda key. It needs the little alarm boxy thing because it's got an immobilizer, so it needs to see this to uh, talk to the uh, ECU, which is conveniently located up under the dash right here. So let's talk a second about the headliner, which is actually not horrible. It's in pretty good shape. Uh, and the cage, the cage serves a pretty important function in the car. We've cut enough of it away to where it's really necessary to hold the car together. Um, and it stiffens the car quite a bit. It is not built to any specific rule sanctioning group. Uh, so as far as, as its legality goes with any kind of SCCA type sanctioning body, I don't think it's really legal for anything. Uh, you might be able to do track days with it, uh, but uh, it really just holds the car together. And I think it looks cool. That's why I made it at the inch and a half size tubing to make it look sort of vintage. These door panels, all the door cards are original. I cleaned up a little bit. All right, this is the back seat, sort of seat delete area. Uh, recently, the most recent development of the car was uh, building this divider and um, finishing off the uh, interior in the car. Uh, my good friend Tom Richardson, uh, who's more than a hobbyist, did the rear panel and uh, did all the upholstery work on the uh, wheel wells and the carpeting and uh, came out quite nice. This is like a fourth iteration on the steering column. Um, originally we built it straight from the rack with just a straight column. Uh, the rack was super offset and had some really weird um, bump steer issues, which took about four times to resolve. And then uh, this is the stock Honda S2000 uh, throttle pedal. And then these Tilton Masters hook up to the Tilton pedals and have adjustable grip brake bias. The exhaust. It starts with a stock exhaust manifold that's been modified about halfway down into a custom collector that then goes straight back and through this hump in the floor that we created to give it some more ground clearance runs through a cat, a silencer, and then a muffler. Uh, pretty excited about the catalyst on the car. I actually ran it without that for a while. It runs much smoother with a cat and it also doesn't stink in traffic, which is kind of nice. Okay, you can uh, chalk this up to an idiosyncrasy of the conversion. This is the stock gas cap. However, it doesn't really go anywhere. So this is the stock Honda S2000 fuel tank. So it's got the full capacity uh, Honda tank with the Honda sending unit that talks to the dash. It's got a standalone filler neck inside the trunk. So if you're in a state like Oregon that pumps your gas for you, it could end in tears if uh, you don't explain that uh, the gas cap is not the gas cap. <laughs> Wheels and tires. 13 by 6 generic Panasport slash mini light replicas. Um, I'm running Vredstein Sprint Classics 205 6013s front and rear. I really like the way the car looks on 13s. I've run it with Avons. I've run it with Toyo Proxies. Um, I've even put GTV wheels on the back of it in a desperate time when I had a flat and nobody would fix my tire with a nail in it and found out that 195 6514s 
are the perfect size to make the RX-7 rear end Honda Speedo combination 100% on the money uh, as far as accuracy goes. With the 13 inch wheels, uh, it's a little bit off. It reads a little bit fast at a, maybe about four miles an hour off at about 80 miles an hour. So um, anyway, that's just a byproduct of slightly lower gearing from the smaller diameter tires. Which is a perfect segue to move on to the brakes. At the rear, running RX-7 rear rotors and calipers. The rotors have been remachined to be 4x108mm to match the custom axles. That way you can interchange the front and rear wheels. The rear pads are just street pads. And up front, uh, we're running Cortina calipers and rotors with Ferrodo DS2500 pads. Uh, those are activated by Tilton Masters, three quarter inch uh, master cylinders, front and rear. I decided on that size based on Sports 2000 cars I was racing, and that master cylinder size gives it a fairly stiff pedal. Um, I don't mind it, but uh, a lot of people would probably find it a little bit unnerving um, because they are, it is quite stiff. That's one of the upgrades I've been thinking of doing that's just never made it to the top of the list. Uh, possibly bigger calipers and um, uh, maybe changing the master cylinder size around to uh, get a little more leverage so to uh, make the uh, brake pedal feel a little bit lighter. But uh, they work. I put over 100,000 miles on this car and it's definitely not a trailer queen show car. It's it's something you can get out and drive and not freak out about. Roughly 80,000 miles were, uh, or more were put on with the Fiat engine combination. I've covered about 20-some thousand uh, post-conversion on the Honda setup. And as a result, it's got some issues. It was painted in the 80s, maybe the early 90s. Uh, and, um, you know, it's got its mileage on it. And... Uh, it shows some uh, some wear, so uh, let's check it out. Rock chips, they're there. And honing straight in on the Cortina badge of the front, obviously a piece of filler that is lifted up. That's been like that for about 10 or 15 years. Um, there's some checking. I don't know if this is lacquer or not. There's a little bit of checking right there. Other side of the hood. This is crack and more checking in this zone. There's a couple of light dents in the hood where a plastic bin fell on it at one point. Believe it or not, the California Melee sticker is not actually hiding any kind of damage. Uh, I just like the way it looks, so it's on there. Could be peeled off. There's nothing underneath. There's some chips and there are plenty of pits. The windshield was pitted even before I got it, so at 100,000 miles, it's definitely a bit pitted. Uh, the rubber's not bad on the windshield. The uh, side light, you know, wind wing uh, rubber, pretty dry right there. Uh, the other side is a little bit better, but uh, the left side is pretty, pretty dry and cracked. Well, let's talk about rust. Uh, structurally, the pan, you know, the bottom of the bottom of the car is very, very good. Um, inner fender wings, I've got photos of that kind of stuff. All that stuff is really solid. The only rust bubble in the quarters is this, and that's been there for 20 years, just like that. The other bubbles, there's some slight bubbling in the roof, just surface stuff right here uh, in the center over the uh, sort of right side, and then over on this side too a little bit. It's a slight ding in the chrome. Right uh, there on the roof, you'll find a chip behind the chrome right there. And there are various other chips and stuff. Uh, this ding down low in the door, which you can see, I'll interject a photo there. Um, that's where it was on a lift and it got lowered with the uh, door open. <laughs> so that's not great. And then there's a little ding down here too, right there. There's one minuscule rust bump right there. There it is. The glass in the mirror, little uh, nerd on it there. There's a crack in the paint at the edge of the trunk. 
that's been there from before the swap. There are a couple of things going on at the uh, rear fenders. This particular one, I've scratched it. It's not, the paint doesn't match right there. Uh, also, uh, rock chips from uh, many miles on and off-road. And uh, another anomaly from the uh, swap, RX-7 rear end actually uses metric studs. Um, and so the lug nuts uh, are standard thread in the front, on the front wheels from the Cortina and metrics in the rear. You'll note there are rock chips on the right rear fender also, and there's a little bit of a bow to this, uh, to this wheel opening above it. Uh, you can see it in certain lights uh, and at certain angles. The headlight surround on the right side has a few dings in it. It is original. The other side has been replaced. Some more paint cracking at the edge of the drip rail. And continuing the slog through imperfections at the back. Chip here, chip there. Uh, the rear bumper uh, shows some pitting. See it right there. And some waves in the uh, overriders. A couple of waves in the main blade. Courtesy of a 6 p.m. Friday night points failure on the Golden Gate Bridge, which resulted in um, getting pushed off by the tow truck and making a lot of friends in the process. More details to follow up the chips. Uh, a little bit of pounding. This has been like this the entire time I've had it. It's a little bit of rough, roughness there on the aluminum of the uh, grill surround. And here's something I never really paid attention to, kind of ever. I just noticed this. Obviously, this has been bondoed right at the seam, and the other side isn't. <laughs> sort of. Uh, and it's a little bit of a ding. There and there for the bumper mounts. Uh, I do have the front bumper. And looking at uh, some other features of it, uh, the headlights are CVs uh, that run H4 bulbs. And here's a quick demonstration of the lights. A couple of other deleted items include the radio, which now houses the wiper switch and the light switch, and the horn. It's appeared in a couple of magazines, 2009 and Classic Ford. And I wrote a blurb in a 2008 Sports Car International magazine uh, accompanying a larger article on a Cortina about the process. All of the Honda parts were sourced from a crashed 2001 S2000 I purchased on eBay. It had only covered 26,000 miles when it suffered a career-ending shunt to the left rear corner. I disassembled it and sold off the unnecessary bits, so the indicated mileage on the dash is an accurate representation of the mileage, with one exception, and that's the transmission. During the sorting phase, it was an issue with the connection of the drive shaft to the transmission, where the connection was not centered. This led to a wicked vibration that cracked the tail shaft housing. Despite welding it up, it happened several times, and I sourced another used transmission with somewhere between 50 and 70,000 miles on it 
to determine whether the transmission itself was causing the issue. It wasn't. And before we cracked that one, we identified and solved the issue. As a result, I also have the 26,000 mile transmission with its cracked housing, which could be re-welded and used as a spare, or for spare parts. The timeline for the build was lengthy. It left the road gulping oil with the Fiat engine in late 2005 and was back under its own power in 2014. The project went in fits and starts, and I had five other Alfa Romeos along the way. I've referred to we in reference to the build many times, and I'd like to thank everyone involved, as I was quickly over my head in many aspects of the project. First, it was Joe Casanova of Casanova Racing, who's built Hot Rods, Sports 2000s, and Bonneville Streamliners, who told me, it's only metal, we can make any of this stuff happen. He did the bulk of the installation fabrication, from placing the motor, to fabricating the transmission tunnel, the front cross member, motor and tranny mounts, did the first pass of the right-hand drive steering rack, and built the cage. Tony Heyer of Higher Performance in Mountain View traditionally works on Porsches, but helped with sorting the master cylinders, running brake lines, and remoting the battery to the trunk. John Pegel of Evil Genius Racing designed and fabricated the rear suspension, narrowed the RX-7 rear end, built and shimmed the limited slope diff, fabricated the exhaust headers, and completed version one of the exhaust system with the modified floor. And he also reworked the steering column and rack positioning. Darren Harder from his shop uh, also deserves a mention for the fab work here too. Performance options of Oakland, California. Joey Gauthier was the F20C swap veteran who made the car a runner. With the wiring, brake lines, parking brake for the RX-7 rear end, he fabbed the fuel neck and uh, was key in the drive shaft and rear end sorting. Mitch Perella at Muffler Works is an artist. He's made some incredibly ex complex exhaust systems and handled the reworking and finishing touches on this system so that it's rattle free and the exhaust comes out the correct side. There were a couple of times I was ready to push it off a cliff during the process, but perseverance prevailed and the result was worth the effort. And there's a healthy stack of uh, receipts for the car as well. Just all sorts of stuff.